debate you, that I was backing away from it, that I was denying that I, attacking you and denying you the opportunity to speak, and I said, if you will designate a representative of the United Pentecostal Church, I will be happy to engage in a dialogue or debate with them. I had only one, and I have, I have co correspondence with you people on this, I have only one question that I want answered. Will you let it be taped so we'll all have a and we'll know exactly what each one of us said? That was all I said. I was challenged. I responded. So you're telling me that I'm taking 90% of the time. The tapes won't show that. All I'm trying to do is respond to the questions. And I'm asking you to respond to things. When I'm trying to answer them, you're coming down on me as if I was the bad guy. I'm the guy that was told that I should respond to you. I'm trying to respond to you. The last question that was on the board also happened to be the fact that the Apostolic Fathers did not teach and uh, the creeds, you said the creeds taught. The Nicene Creed, you see. You, you're saying the, the Council Trinity. of Nicaea f was responsible for the Trinity. Your church history is faulty. The Nicene Conference was called for the express purpose of dealing with the Arian heresy, which did not attack the Trinity because Arius said he believed in the Trinity. Arius attacked, it was a phony Trinity, but Arius attacked specifically the deity of Jesus Christ and said, once the Son of God was not. That's what brought about the Council of Nicaea. The Son of God was a creature. What the Nicene Creed did was to enunciate once and for all against heretical teaching that there was an eternal person, Jesus Christ. That's Nicaea. It's practically impossible to answer you, Dr. Martin, because you interrupt and you, you speak down and tell us where we've made our faults. So if you're questioning whether we'd be interested in the debate or not, I challenge you to a public debate at any place of your choosing. I challenge you to a public debate where we'll each have the same format, the same amount of time, and the subject will be the Trinity versus the Oneness, historically and biblically. And I'll be glad to be there with and face you with formal rules of debate. With a, with a trained debate moderator? I would be very happy to meet Dr. Walter Martin under those circumstances. Splendid because idea. then it okay, wouldn't be set up. All right, as long as you're going to have the debate someplace else, let's, uh, <laughs> let's uh, answer this question here right to his face that uh, you said that uh, he said that the creeds were the thing. He said no, that the creeds were not necessarily the thing that's, that taught the Trinity. He so, said that uh, Tertullian was... Uh, I, I've, I've understood him right. One of the first ones to use the term Trinity he certainly was. Was Tertullian a Trinitarian? He said church history taught. Was Tertullian a Trinitarian? Tertullian no, your question was that was you said that church history taught that the creeds were the thing that taught, the first thing that taught the Trinity. He said no, it was not. And he didn't I say that. I see it was an outcome of the big discussion between Tertullian and Arius. Tertullian lived a century before. Yes, Arius. but I mean the teaching of it. Was a Tertullian was a subordinationist. You know, Tertullian was an eternal generationist. The point from origin, but the point that we're getting at here, which is important, is that Nicaea, in your debate with uh, that I heard, you came down hard on the guys on Nicaea. And I just want to set the record straight. Nicaea was not Trinitarian argumentation. Nicaea was Christological on the person of the Lord Jesus. Uh, that, we don't argue. We yes, right. you do. No, you say that the Trinity started at Nicaea. I didn't it say it didn't. started there. Oh, come on now, Bob. It, it, it started at origins uh, 500 years before Christ, actually. Uh, <laughs> who? Not this Trinity. There, no. There's not a reputable church historian that does not uh, trace the doctrine of the Trinity to the philosophy of Plato and Philo in Alexandria and from them How about you, J. N. D. Kelly at Oxford? Would you, would you accept J. N. D. Kelly of Oxford as a re reasonable story? I have J. N. D. Kelly's quote. You sure. would? Sure. Would you like to? Is you got to I make a quote? Give, give, give us some, Bob. Yeah, give, give us, us Kelly. Go ahead. You give us Kelly. Well, you said you right, had wait, wait, wait. to He said give us Kelly. Let me, uh, I've got it right here. Page 22. 21, starting Reputable church historian. Yes, taught patristics, church fathers at Oxford. In his book, he says, he lists, I counted them, 26 verses starting with the New Testament that show the primary foundation of that which would become the creeds found right in the New Testament scriptures. And this is what he says. He says, that nevertheless, the Trinitarian ground plan obtrudes itself obst obstinately throughout, talking about all these passages that he's just list, listed, 26 of them referring directly to the Trinity. And its presence is all the more striking because more often than not, there is nothing in the context to necessitate it. 
the impression inevitably conveyed is that the conception of the threefold manifestation of the Godhead was embedded deeply in Christian thinking from the start and provided a ready-to-hand mold in which the ideas of the apostolic writers took shape. If Trinitarian creeds are rare, the Trinitarian pattern which was to dominate all later creeds was already part and parcel of the Christian tradition of doctrine. J. N. D. Kelly, page 21 and 22. And I have quotes going all the way through the Apostolic Fathers from Kelly. The statement's not true, according to him, Bob. Um, John, it's uh, plain to see that uh, this discussion, uh, we've entered into it. Uh, we came here in uh, honesty. And uh, it's plain to see that you're not impartial. And, Bob, uh, I'm just presenting that, what you, 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 you asked. You, you asked the question. You're saying I'm impartial because I, wrote, I read a quote from this. No. I, I listened to your debate. And I wrote down, because I had to memorize under a Harvard professor, Williston Walker's church history, which you quoted. I'm prepared to quote that. You quoted Harnack. Would you like to see what Harnack had to say? I have what Harnack said. Okay, Go ahead. let me read Harnack here for you. Talking about uh, the very view that you're holding. It says, concerning monarchianism, they could appeal, talking about the church fathers, one, to the rule of faith, in which the personal distinction between the father and son was recognized. Number two, to the Holy Scriptures from which it was, in fact, easy to reduce the arguments of the monarchians to absurdity. Number three, to the distinction between Christians and Jews, which consisted, of course, in the belief of the former in the Son. And lastly, and this was the most important point, they could cite the Johannine writings, especially in support of the doctrine of the Logos. It was of the highest importance in the controversy.